property. So um, the frequent quote you often hear people say is you shouldn't meet your heroes in life because you could be very disappointed. So I was very fortunate in the last uh, year or so to meet one of my heroes who's our guest this evening and it's Mr. Ross Byrne. And Ross, I was going to do the big introduction, you know, tell people that you're 8th of April 1995, that you're six foot four and read out all the honours. And if I, as I started reading the list, I realised it was ridiculously long for such a young person. Uh, but definitely 2018, I have to read out European Rugby Champions Cup winner and Pro 14 winner on four occasions. And uh, that's that's probably the Ross Byrne people know a lot about. And I definitely want to ask you some rugby questions. But um, I think really the purpose of the podcast is to give people an insight into people's lives and maybe a little bit of inspiration for their own lives. So first of all, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. And uh, first question, Ross, is this. Tell me about lockdown. How, how good or how bad was COVID-19 to you? Uh, well, thanks very much for having me on. Uh, excited to be on. Uh, lockdown was interesting, I suppose. Um, I mean, probably similar to, to most people's. I mean, it's probably scary to think now. It's a year ago at this stage. Um, but, I mean, obviously everything stopped for us um, a year ago or over a year ago now. Um, I suppose we were just training on our own and, I suppose pretty much did all my training with Harry, my brother, which obviously made a big difference. Um, but I mean, it wasn't overly exciting. And then I suppose we were probably fortunate that we were back training as a team before most others, because we were, I suppose we were classified as the, the elite sportsman yeah. or elite sports team, which obviously helps. But even the whole year has been really strange with no crowds and um, different kind of restrictions we've had in training and whatnot. And it's it's definitely, I don't think we're, we've probably been as bad as some of the other teams in, in other countries. Um, but I suppose you're looking at other teams playing in front of crowds at the moment. And we're, I suppose, we're hoping to get crowd next week, I think 1,200 in the ODS, which would be brilliant. Um, but I think it's those little things that you probably take for granted at times, um, which I suppose we're, probably never take for granted again really yeah definitely definitely i remember i was working speaking at a conference in um, the aviva i think it was a vodafone had a launch of some their digital media campaign and i was the guest speaker but i remember beforehand i went for a walk around the aviva on my own and i walked down the tunnel and i was thinking god imagine walking out here with with the full house and um then I was thinking the other night, I've actually done what Leinster players have done is walked out into an empty Aviva. It must be very strange walking out with total silence, is it? It is. It is really, really weird. I mean, I'll never forget the first game last August. Uh, we played Munster in the Aviva, actually, and it was it was even when we kind of went out and it was even the first kind of five minutes, you could almost get a sense of everyone, Leinster, Munster, just been like, this is insane, kind of. Um, <laughs> it had such a eerie kind of feel to it. And obviously, we've gotten a lot more used to it and stuff but there's been I suppose there's a lot of lads who've even kind of broke into the the Leinster and the Ireland team this year who've never played in front of a full house maybe, which is yeah. it is mad it, it's yeah it's scary to think really and that it's almost become a little bit normal but thankfully we're we're getting back to I suppose closer to having full stadiums at least even in the Premier League in England and stuff the last two yeah. games I've had kind of 10,000 in the Heineken Cup final and stuff I think it was around 10,000 as well. So it is, I suppose, great to see that we are getting closer to that because it's, it's something you do miss. Yeah, I watched the very first match where there was a crowd, I don't know, was it only a couple of thousand allowed into an Exeter match? And I was thinking, you know, is it going to be that much different? And it was a small crowd. And I remember there was a, there was a huge Gary Owen kicked and the full black came up and the entire 2,000 people went, whoa. And of course, he dutifully dropped it and knocked on and the crowd went crazy. And I went, oh, yeah, I forgot how good that was, you know, <laughs> the, the, the excitement and, and and the slagging and the abuse, you know, because anyone who's ever been to Musgrave Park or Thomond when there's a match on when Leinster playing Munster, the, the abuse is always quality, good, good quality and, and funny some of it, you know. <laughs> Ross, I, want to ask you, I was doing all the reading and I thought like a new loads about you and then I, I discovered that, that your dad, um, what your dad does for a living and, you know, how, how hard he's worked to get where he is. Um, my own dad definitely, you know, he's had a huge effect on my life. I often say to people, the dad I am or the husband I am is partly because of my dad. How much of an influence do you think uh, Pat has had on, on, on you and Harry in a sporting sense? Or do you, can you see bits of him in it? Because I find myself now with my kids and I say, you know, I say something to them and I hear my father's voice coming out. He would have said it the exact same way. And I go, oh, my God, I'm morphing into him. How, how much of an influence do you think he's had on you as young men growing up? 
Uh, enormous, really. Um, I suppose uh, I was kind of laughing there when you said it because I suppose we were, I would say we were pushed into the garden to, to start playing sport. Playing rugby. Uh, pretty much as, as soon as we could walk, we probably had a rugby ball in our hands. And um, I suppose we were playing sport from whatever age. And I suppose he was always driving it, not that we needed really to be pushed. Um, but I suppose, yeah, he was the one that was. The, the the instigator will say um and he was he was the same my mum really as well they'd be going to every game they could over the years whether it was a game here in Dublin or if we were playing down in Cork or up in Belfast they'd be always going um to attend everything they possibly could or even if it was abroad and then I suppose it was even myself and Harry even played played Gaelic for Chemical Croaks for a good few years as well so I suppose it wasn't even just a rugby they'd be they'd be supporting us in, in everything we did really um, which obviously made a huge difference and we definitely I suppose wouldn't be where we are in Leinster have had the success in our careers uh, without them I suppose and how they have kind of pushed us on over the years Yeah I know my, my, do you know um, ironically it was Michaels my mother came to one match I went to Newbridge and she saw me play Michaels and it was um I think it was, I think it was under fifteen, something like that. But I remember the guy that was I was playing twelve, and the guy opposite me, I minced him. The first two tackles killed him, and um, my mother was really embarrassed that I was after her. Like she actually went to seek out the parents of this other kid and apologised for her thug of a, of a son. And then a few minutes later, of course, somebody decked me and I got run over and she was horrified, was I injured? And um, she came to me afterwards. She said, that's my last game. She said, I can't, I can't watch you go and see that every week. I can only imagine what it's like for them to watch you at, uh, you know, at international level or to watch you play for Leinster. Like it must be traumatic for them. Do they talk about that? Uh, well, they probably never have to worry about us physically hurting anyone. <laughs> I don't think that's ever been an issue. But um, I mean, I'm sure it is. Yeah, I'm sure they're so used to it. I'm, I'd imagine yeah. at this point that um, it's probably normal. It was actually funny even during the uh, the lockdown, the first lockdown. Um, and on the first kind of few Friday or Saturdays, um, people were kind of saying, and are like, our our sisters and our other brother kind of going, geez, it's weird because it'd always be all oh, who's going to the game or we meet up for a drink yeah. beforehand or whatever yeah. it is. And I suppose it was gone, geez, this is insane. There's, there's nothing to kind of talk about. Um, I suppose it is a massive part of of our family's life. Um, but I'm sure there are certain games where they are probably almost playing the game um, themselves a little bit. Um, yeah. But I, I imagine they're also so probably, they're so used to it at this point. Yeah, I, I miss, I do, you know, I, I was talking to someone about that the other night and I said I miss, like I love the sport of rugby, I love technically, I love the, I, saw, I love watching patterns and tactics, I love figuring that out, but I love everything that goes around it, like I love, you know, you know, getting a nice comfy coat or shoes and I like, you know, driving to the match and going somewhere nice to eat before the match and, um, you know, someone's a real addict then, I really love watching the recording of the match that I was at live and going, God, I miss that, I miss that, that's how you know you're really, really into it, but um yeah, I miss meeting up with my brother or, you know, getting the programme and, you know, going into going into Paddy Powers on the way, all that stuff. I miss that, you know. Ross, can I ask you, do you know, like, I'm very lucky, like, this week I've met some incredible people on the podcast, like I was saying to you on off air there, I'm speaking to Keith, uh, Barry, and I'm speaking later on this evening to Senator Joan Freeman, and, like, a lot of people will know her as the lady who founded Pieta House and has literally changed thousands of people's lives in Ireland, saved lives, um, and she was, you know, inspired by the loss of her own sister. Um, you know, in your life, excluding rugby, you know, because I know you're permanently surrounded with by amazing leaders and great people in rugby. Like, who do you find inspiration from in in the, in the outside world, outside of rugby, or or is it very hard to look outside of that bubble when you're permanently within? Um, I suppose I'd be a, a huge sports fan. Um, and I'd watch, I suppose, a lot of other sports. Um, I'd probably watch a crazy amount of, of football. Um, and then even a good bit of GA over the summer and mm. golf. So um, I suppose I've always kind of looked at different sort of things and different teams. So, I mean, there's probably, there isn't one that's probably s stood out. Um, even, I suppose, if you're just looking at the Dublin footballers, I suppose, over the last kind of five, six years, even kind of what they've done and the, 
sustain success. And they're probably an example we even used in Leinster a good bit. Um, I suppose kind of as a team, it's incredibly impressive. Um, and then even different individuals in terms of tennis players or golfers, in terms of the Federers and Dows or Tiger Woods, people who are able to, I suppose, sustain, sustain success. And even someone like Phil Mickelson coming back and being the oldest ever kind of major winner. Um, yeah. See, it's funny there. You, you, you think Phil is old? <laughs> I said oldest ever. <laughs> maybe I would say old. We're at the same age, I think. So uh, I, I don't see it that bad. And, and you know, you were talking earlier about playing in the garden with, with Harry and, and playing sports from early age. Can you, what, what's your earliest childhood memory? You know, when you go right back to the beginning, my, I can remember getting murdered by my parents because um, it was a summer's day. I was about four and I needed a drink. And I remember drinking from a puddle on the road and I remember getting killed for this. It still sticks in my mind. And I suppose I shortly after that, I remember too, my dad worked for the Farmer's Journal and he used to distribute Superman comics and Spider-Man comics. And I can still see the Spider-Man comics in the back boot of our car that I wasn't allowed to touch because they were obviously belonging to somebody else. How far back can you go? What can you remember as a kid? Very, very earliest. Um, and can oh, I just yeah, I can... people who are listening to the podcast and not watching this on YouTube, your face was brilliant just now. You just went, oh, Jesus, where is he going with this question? <laughs> <laughs> uh I don't know. I suppose I can always kind of remember. But like I say, remember, it seems like it's probably even recent enough. Um, Harry, myself, probably destroying something in the garden with a ball or, <laughs> or in the house or something like that. And I suppose even from a, a rugby perspective, one of the first memories I have is my dad played for Wanderers for years and loves to gloat about it that he played in a team full of internationals and the best team in Ireland and so on. But he brought me down there when I was like, four maybe or something ridiculous yeah. you know four or five um i remember my friends in school were playing in, in old belvo and he had to kind of <laughs> swallow this swallow that bill and he had to he had to go down to old belvo and cheer you exactly, on exactly yeah so that was always kind of a standing out memory i suppose and i always kind of remember that sort of first kind of training session um yeah. that, that i suppose that would be always a memory that sticks out yeah, I was I was very lucky a couple of years ago to work as a, a mentor, a motivational speaker with the Waterford Senior Hurling Team. Um, and we won the National League that year and beat, I think we'd be, we beat Cork in the final and got to the All-Ireland final. But I remember the first time that I was in the dressing room at the very first match and I had never, you know, played at elite sport level, but I was in this dressing room and um, said a few words and, and Derek McGraw was in charge. He said his words, the team went out. I remember at half time he came back in and I know Derek won't mind me saying this, but he literally exploded. And I rang my wife halfway through the second half and she said, how, how, well, what's it like behind the scenes? And I said, honest to God, I feel like I've just come out of the Coliseum and crashed the car. I just was traumatized at the intensity of emotion of, you know, drama of spirit. It was just like something I'd never experienced. Can you, can you remember, um, I think it's 2015. Can you remember your very first senior Leinster dressing room? Could you remember what that felt like? Um, my very first, yeah, it was actually during the World Cup, um, in 2015. So I suppose half, not half, but a lot of the squad would have been away. Yeah. Um, at the World Cup, um, my first game was actually Edinburgh away, but it wasn't in Murrayfield. It was. Oh, wasn't that funny? Place called place called Me Megaland or something Me like Me that. <laughs> um, yeah, I remember reading that. Yeah, I remember it just. I suppose on one hand it was kind of a little bit disappointing because you're kind of God, you're this is your first game for Lancaster playing in this sort of yeah. this club ground and you're kind of going, Jesus, yeah, yeah. this isn't all it's built up to be. But um it was, I suppose, incredibly even weird just to see some players you've been watching over the years. I remember I was sitting actually beside Isaac Boss in the change room, we were both on the bench. I suppose you're just this is this is bizarre. You're watching him kind of lift high and cups or play for Ireland over the last number of years and all of a sudden you're about to run onto the pitch with them. Um, and at the time you're kind of going, God, I couldn't have seen myself here two or three years earlier, kind of. And then all of a sudden it just happens. And even now I've played over a hundred games since and you're going, geez, this is gone in the blink of an eye. And <laughs> kind of remembering yourself when you're 19, you're going, God, I don't know if I ever would have yeah. imagined it to kind of go that quickly. Um, and all of a sudden you kind of almost, you're a senior player in the squad. Yeah, have you found yourself looking across the dressing room in, in like the last season or two and looking at someone thinking, God, he looks like he's making his first communion. We won't ask you to name anyone, but do you look across <laughs> do you look across at maybe some of the very, very newest arrivals and go, God, was I that young? Was I that naive starting? Yeah, 
little bit, yeah. And even I suppose in in training or if someone makes a mistake, you kind of go, oh, come on, like as in, and then you kind of have to catch his well, like if I'm giving out about that or if he's done something wrong, I, I should probably think about how bad I was at that age or like what I would have been like that age as well. So they kind of do have to, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Rain that- in a little bit. Sometimes we forget, I think, in sports that some people are so young and so inexperienced and it can take time, I suppose. Yeah, it's funny how, you know, I, I, I when I work with different businesses or different teams or people, like your life experience very much feeds into your professional experience, you know, like you need to, I remember saying to my wife years ago, why did I never, like I enjoy working so much as a speaker now, I said, why didn't I do this years ago? And she said, you couldn't have, you had to learn your lessons, make your mistakes, you know, overcome your difficulties, it shapes you as a person and, and, and I think it's probably sporting wise, would I be right in saying it shapes you on the sporting field too, you know, as you've grown as a person, you grow as a player, would that be fair? Yeah, I think massively, yeah. Um, I think some people are probably not. Um, some people are probably, they just go straight in, they don't even th- have to think about anything too much and sometimes they're, when they're younger, they're almost a little bit better um, because they're kind of, they don't know anything about it so they just go out and express themselves. Um, but I, I do think overall, yeah, the more, you grow, the more experience you get um, on and off the pitch. I think it's going to help you in, in both areas as well. Yeah. Do you know you said if someone drops a ball in play, you get angry? Actually, I was laughing because on, on my on my list of uh, Ross questions, the actual next question that I had written down was, what makes you angry in life? And I, I, I spoke to someone recently, we were talking, for me, it's, it's things like negativity. You know, someone who says, oh, God, the brown bread is very brown or you know, it, like it might be sunny today for one hour and I can enjoy that one hour of sunshine and I can read a book and anyone watching this on YouTube can see I burnt the nose for myself today. But, you know, some people say, God, the weather was terrible today. It was raining and miserable for 23 hours. Uh, negative people, I think, really make me angry. And I think I think people... Not, I'd, I'd probably make you angry all the time. No, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> not at all. But people, people who uh, people can't see the positive. And I think, too, I, I, I don't have much time for people who don't have empathy, you know, who can't you know, put themselves in someone else's shoes and imagine how they're living or feeling. That Those make me angry. But I, I, can you can you pick pinpoint things that you have impatience for or get angry with? <laughs> apart from apart from uh, young players, academy players dropping uh, dropping balls or not remembering liners. <laughs> so I'm going to have to change my answer after the, the negativity point. I was saying I would definitely probably be one of those people who would be, <laughs> be moaning if the weather's not, not great all the time. But... Um, Oh, I don't know. I mean, there's 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 nothing I can say that's gonna. You don't. There is. I'm, I'm sure there's a load of things. I mean, day in day out, in terms of, or training, or or different things we're doing, or mistakes we make. But um, I would say yeah, it's probably also also just part of it. Um, yeah. I suppose it's we're not, we're all we're not robots. Um, so everyone's gonna make mistakes and in, in everything in life, really. Um, and it's I suppose just trying to deal with them as as best as possible and trying to be as positive and even if you are being I suppose critical of someone doing it in a positive manner even if I don't know how much sense that makes but um do you do you find Russ do you need to do much mental prep in terms of you know you're you're in a job that is extremely high pressure um you know if I make a mistake on the podcast I can edit delete and fix it and no one will ever see the you know the the the, the mistakes and the errors but you know, you're taking a kick on front of the post. There's 40,000 people, you know, there's there's thousands of people watching, millions maybe worldwide. Like, do you have to do much mental prep or do you find that you're naturally strong and that you can focus and shut out? Or do you actually train your brain as well as training your body? Uh, definitely a bit of both. I definitely didn't do any mental prep, I would say. Or I would have done subconscious, let's say, mental prep when I was younger uh, in terms of a little bit of visualization and stuff like that. But that would have been even just kind of more a bit of the mix of excitement and nerves and thinking about the game whereas now I would do probably a lot more mental prep in terms of if I'm watching video of the opposition or video of us training and then trying I suppose visualize that and what's going to happen on the match and then even I suppose as you're saying certain kicks or stuff like that um it's definitely something I've probably thought about a lot more uh in the last probably year or two um and i think it's something we as it's probably in all of sport i I suppose i can't really speak for for other sports but it's something even in rugby we do so much physical training and not 
we probably neglect a little bit um, the mental side of things. Um, it's something I suppose in answer we do probably drive a lot in terms of our, our mental preparation is so important. And I find if I don't get it right, um, I'll probably be a little bit worried about my performance at the weekend. Whereas I suppose if, if I know if I've done all of it, that I can kind of just go out and play and enjoy it really is the big thing. And then I find if I'm, yeah, if I'm I enjoying, I'm trying to play a bit better. I spoke, I spoke to this lady who she was doing her PhD in um, sports psychology and she was specializing in flow. Can, can, do you, have you experienced that lots? Is it, a, is it a frequent thing for you where you're just not conscious of people, everything just goes and you're not even, you know, the angst would say, you know, I'm in the zone. Do you, do you get many t- appearances where the entire game is just a pure state of flow and there's, everything just seems to work easily for you? Or is that an urban myth or a sporting myth? No, it, it definitely, I think, is real. Um, it's probably a little bit harder to gauge um, in a team sport. I mean, I suppose for someone, in an individual sport, a golf or a tennis player, they probably know, like, it's a lot easier probably for them to gauge. It's not relying on anyone else. I suppose the, the beauty of rugby is, for me to probably be in that flow, I need the forwards to be doing their job right, and I need the people inside and out to be, to be, to be kind of playing pretty well. Um, so I suppose... You definitely do get those moments, but I suppose it's trying to get the that collectively. Um, and then on the back of that, you might get a few kind of standout performances. But uh, I do think it definitely is a real thing. Um, but it's, for me, it's probably trying to get that as a as a collective and trying to get the team into that flow. Yeah. And can I, can I ask you too, you know, like, I mean... Anyone around the world will have heard the name of Leinster Rugby. I remember we were in the south of France a couple of years ago in Carcassonne and I went to the local shop and I was wearing my Leinster t-shirt and uh, my spoken French is okay, but the lady in the shop said, oh, Leinster. And I said, yeah. And um, she said, oh, my husband has to meet you. He's a big Toulouse supporter. And he he was there the next day. It was Bastille night. And just on the strength of the Leinster badge, they asked us, my family, to dinner in their house. And we were on a hill overlooking Carcassonne with amazing fireworks on, on uh, Bastille night just because of, you know, the link with, with, with rugby. Um, the quality that Leinster bring, you know, has, has brought results and has brought success. Um, you know, it's, it strikes me, if you look down through the panel at the moment, you see Michaels, 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 and <laughs> Michaels. <laughs> Do you see a lot of similarities? I know you were kids and, you know, you, it, you know it's, it's, it's a different level, but still Leinster Senior Cup is, you know, it's, it's a tough, tough competition to win. Uh, do you see similarities between the two set up, setups and the two cultures? Um, yeah, it's definitely even changed drastically in St. Michael's since I've been there. Um, I was actually speaking to Andy Skeen and McMahon, who were the coaches there. Um, they would have coached me when I was in school now, I think, but it's eight years ago now. Um, but they were even just showing me, I suppose, a little kind of presentation of what they're giving to the players and I suppose they were talking about how they're playing, but also, I suppose, to kind of the culture and the environment perspective. And I was pretty blown away by it, to be honest. It's it's phenomenal what's kind of going on at the moment in terms of their driving the players to be as good as they can be. And the information they're giving technically is, I suppose, next level. It's almost professional standard, but I suppose they're also driving kind of the culture, the environment, and I suppose even how to grow as a person away from rugby um, which is something that probably has gone to a new level since we were even in school um, and it's as close to a professional setup you can be and I think I say that as an, an absolute positive because I know people probably get critical of schools like Michael and Michaels and Black Rock and they kind of say oh these kind of elite schools and almost like rugby academies but in terms of their they drive everything, I suppose, for the students in terms of rugby, but also outside of rugby in terms of their academics or anything as well. And I think it's it's a great lesson, I suppose, for the students um, in terms of what life is going to be like. Yeah, I, I, well, I'm a big fan of the All Blacks. And, you know, that's really reflected in their culture that, you know, it's like, you know, the, that thing that great people make great rugby players, you know, and it's it's your friendships, your community involvement, your intellectual growth, all those things make you a better person, make you a better sportsman. So it's true, you know. Um, do you know anyone listening to this will have heard that, uh, not that I'm keeping score, but I think you've said golf about 15 times, Ross. Is there, um, 
is there a hidden <laughs> hidden addiction there? I did see on Instagram you cracked an amazing drive. I don't know where you were the other day. You uh, you hit an amazing drive, and I said, "There's a man planning to switch careers in the future." What's the handicap? And uh, and tell us tell us how the golf is going. Jeez, yeah, it's a nice plug there. If anyone wants to bring me out to a nice golf course, uh, no, I was down in Kinsale. Well, I, I'm going to stop. Uh, you. The handicap would only be 14, um, so okay, I'd be uh, I'd, only, I'd be decent. I wouldn't wouldn't be wouldn't be great. Now. Um, yeah, okay. But, so just anyone lit plays, you know, there's two <laughs> numbers. So your official handicap is 14, and I'm sure um, your friends and family would tell us the real number. So what, what do you that think? is the real number. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't. Uh, and who who would you who would you think is the best Leinster golfer? Who's who's the shark? Uh, who do you have to watch out for? Jordan Larmer and maybe Adam Byrne are probably be the two that are right up there. Yeah, really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Don't know if that's a surprise to people or not, but um, yeah, the two of them would be right up there. Uh, unfortunately, they're um, very frustrating to play against. <laughs> very difficult to beat. <laughs> Yeah, you don't, you, you know, you have that uh, champion mindset. You don't like losing. Like, I, I would think if you played snakes and ladders, you'd probably try really, really hard. I think you'd put that concentration. You know, I've spoken to you a few times and um, you probably don't even remember this, but very early on, one of the first times I spoke to you, I asked you a question and you were much like you are now for people listening. Ross is very smiley, positive, affable, nice guy. And I made the mistake of asking you a question. I said to you, Ross, did you did you always did you did you ever doubt or did you always know that you'd um, you'd be a professional rugby player? And you literally on the spot went, never doubt, absolutely convinced. And it was just sheer steel focus. And it stuck with me for months later because it was it was an instinctual answer. You know, you, have you always had that burning will to to win to succeed? Is it something that's always been there? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's as you said, it doesn't really matter what it is um i'd always be really competitive um on and off the rugby pitch um and i don't know maybe sometimes it's probably over competitive but yeah it's it's probably something that's got me to to where i am now so i don't know if, i don't think i'd be taking it away from yeah it's 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 you know it's a great thing to have i you know sometimes my, my kids laugh you know at um, you know, at Christmas, I I would be the, the the dad who had to go upstairs and put some hotels or houses in my pocket because if times got bad during the Monopoly game, I'd produce one of my hidden uh, cheating <laughs> hotels, and it's only at that point I'm going like, hang on, I'm playing Monopoly at Christmas here or Scrabble, and I have to win. And it's funny I have that switch too that I can be really nice, but the minute I'm competitive, you know, I really want to win. You know, Ross, can I ask you a weird question? You know, in Back to the Future, you know the the the, the, the what you call the car DeLorean. Yes. No, I can't remember his name. Doc. I can never remember the doc. You know the doc. But um, yeah. the car hits 88 miles per hour and the flux capacitor kicks in and you can travel to whatever date. Uh, if you if you had the uh, DeLorean for the weekend and uh, we hit 88 kilometers an hour or 88 miles an hour, where would you go back to? Like, can, it's in your, like you're a very young man and you've had a, an amazing life so far. But if you could go back to the golden month or the golden time in that car, where would you go? The golden time, God. Um, would it be the very early stages? Like, would it be? Uh, well, I definitely know it wouldn't be when you were, when you lost junior or senior cups. Would it be that time in sixth year when you, you know, you you finally won your, your senior cup, or would it be, you know, first Heineken Cup? What would you think? Uh, I suppose maybe twenty eighteen. Yeah, uh, after we won the double, those couple of days were uh, pretty special. They were probably the some of the best days of our lives really so probably probably then yeah and what and what would you say to what would you say to somebody who you know like one of the most common things are people ask me is as an inspiration as a motivational speaker people often say to me you know they're looking for their own inspiration they're looking for their own journey in life and like i'm very keen to tell people you know i'm just an ordinary person i might have done some crazy adventures but you know as I'm a motivational speaker, people think sometimes I'm going to hop out in the morning, have hop out of bed in the morning, and I'm going to do like a thousand push-ups and you know eat raw chilies and uh, you know that I've got this magic power desire to achieve and, and to do crazy things. And you know I, I I'm very keen to tell people I'm just a normal person that you know some days the knees hurt and some days I don't want to go to the gym and you know some days I don't want to do the podcast or some days I don't want to mm. write something. You know. What would you say to someone who's who's uh, who's you know looking for their life purpose or their mission? Is that, I know it's an incredibly hard question, but you know you you and I I think we're really lucky in that we've found things in life we have a passion for. What would you say to mm. someone who hasn't found that passion? 
Uh, it's a difficult question. I mean, I think everyone has doubts about everything they do. And I suppose even for yourself, myself, I mean, you're saying there's days where you're you're getting up and you're kind of feeling a bit tired sore. I mean, I definitely have those days as well. Yeah. I think everyone <laughs> have does. Every day. I think it's, it probably wouldn't be normal if you didn't. Every now and then you're kind of going, oh, God, can I do this? And I think, I suppose the biggest thing is probably to make sure that you're having the majority of the time you're not thinking that. Um, I think it's okay to probably have those kind of thoughts and probably just, as well, maybe when you are thinking about that, you're kind of, thinking about what is the ultimate goal or what are you what's your kind of what are you striving for or trying to get out of this day or this week or this hour or whatever it is as though maybe pairing it back um to little sort of little goals um and then trying to achieve them and then build your build your confidence back up and hopefully yeah. you're feeling oh, I, think is, I think that's solid advice because uh, you know some when, when when my you know someone hasn't uh, followed my backstory so I, I, I carried a washing machine nine marathons in eight days and I carried it up Kilimanjaro and people sometimes say to me, how the hell do you get in that kind of condition to carry a washing machine? And like one of the, one of the weird things was um, when I, when I went to the bathroom every day, I, I would do five or 10 push-ups, and when I washed my hands, I do five or 10 push-ups, and multiply that by five times a day. So by persistent, consistent effort, just doing something small that first year, I did 32,000 push-ups, and that was excluding gym sessions or as mad as it sounds running around the country with a washing machine. But all of a sudden, <laughs> I was able to do something that I, you know, that I didn't think was ever possible that I could do, you know, and I think people sometimes focus for me when I'm talking to people, they focus on the end goal, you know, they focus on this amazing thing they'd like to do. And for me, what works and when I'm mentoring people is like the process, like just doing a great morning this morning, doing a great afternoon today, you know, tomorrow, improving that, just keeping it small and keeping consistent. And that's, that's where magic happens. Cause I think a lot of people want to race to, you know, to the nth degree and get there, you know? Yeah, uh, definitely. Ask, can, weird, weird question number 75, because every time I've asked you a question, you're going, bloody hell, and I didn't think you were going to give me this hard of a time. One, one of our la last questions. Um, is there anything you can think of that most people, you know, like there's there's Ross Byrne, the rugby player. Is there anything you can think of that um, that people would be really surprised to know about you? That if they If they went, God, I didn't know that, you know? Like um, I I I'll go first, Russ. So I, my, oh god, <laughs> the kids were, when the kids were smaller, I I used to um well I, I have a Maeve and Oshin and a Fionn, so we spoke Irish at home the whole time, and um, I love languages. I'm obsessed. Um, I love French. Um, wh what would people not know about you that's not about to be launched into the public forum? It doesn't have to be something major, dramatic. But what would you what would you think people are surprised that you're into, or that you you do, or you've a, you spend time in that that doesn't uh, doesn't fit with the Ross Byrne public image? I really don't know. I don't know what the, I suppose I don't know what the public image is. Um, I mean, I, I consider myself pretty. I don't know what is normal. I suppose, but. Um, I don't really have an answer for you there. It's okay. Honest. It's okay. That's okay. No, but it's like what well, you know. Uh, you, you could turn around and say uh, there's, there's uh, nothing mental that's that sticks out. Um, that's okay too. You know, like it's some sometimes uh, it's a bit boring maybe. <laughs> well, I definitely, I definitely don't think so. You know, we were talking there about anger and emotion. I love a good pint of Guinness. I suppose maybe. maybe <laughs> that's <something>. <laughs> 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 yeah, classic. The pint of the black stuff. It's full of nutrition. It's healthy. It's good for you. you yeah, need exactly, yeah. Again. I, I'll take that. I'll take that. I thought you were going to tell me that you were mad into Batman or that you had a you had a huge Spider Man collection or something like that. But a pint again. Uh, I'd like the Marvel movies though. I have to. Uh, there you go. There you go. The, uh, list, the list is growing. We've Guinness now and Marvel movies on top of that. That'd be some combination. Yeah. I mean, you know the way rugby players like. I mean. It's funny, there's, a, there's a, a rugby persona, like, you know, like you've got to front up and you've got to win your one-on-one -on -one battles and, you, you know, you've got to show no fear. How, 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 I suppose, how good would you think rugby players are at expressing emotion? Uh, I know there's been loads of mental health campaigns, you know, like in terms of mind yourself or tackle your feelings. How, how hard or how difficult would you think is it for rugby players, not you per personally, but for rugby players, like to express weakness or express difficulties in life? You know, given that, you know, the, the, the culture is to be aggressive, to be manly, to be strong, not to admit weakness. Uh, do you, sorry, do you mean like in, in the change room or in the public or, or kind of I both? Think, I, think, I think both, you know, I think in, in you know, as, as a team, you know, 
if it would would it be acceptable for someone to admit look i've i'm suffering huge anxiety or i've got depression or i'm, I'm going through a tough time is is it an environment yeah. that people can speak out i i think so definitely um it's and i mean i i could be wrong I and mean, maybe there's people who who haven't kind of spoke out about that sort of thing but i, I do feel like it is a an environment where you, you you could speak out and it's probably an incredibly difficult thing to do because of the amount of people even in the squad and the staff and probably does feel uncomfortable but um I do feel like people could if if they wanted to that they I don't think there'd be any backlash off the back of it or there'd be no kind of hard feelings or slagging. I, I think it would be a pretty open and accepting environment to be honest it's great that's great it's great to hear because it's it's funny sometimes you know um the the plug 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 but the the title of my book was i'm fine and you know the premise of it was when i was at my worst and my more lowest moments my most dark mental health moments um people said how are you doing and i said oh i'm great you know i'm fine with a huge smile on my face and you know on, when when the book came out i was very keen the picture on the book is me screaming because the reality of what i was saying wasn't true I, w I was really in a dark place and contemplating taking my own life. And um, I suppose part of me getting involved in mental health charities was to get people to realize that, you know, um, it's OK to say that I, I'm struggling. I, I think personally, too, I remember when I spoke at my first few conferences or mental health events about my own anxiety, my, my depression, my suicidal thoughts. Like, I remember people coming up to me and saying, Jesus, we thought you had, you know, like you have a beautiful wife, you have a lovely home, your kids are, you know, really successful, you seem really confident. I was the guy, you know, first in suited and booted. But the truth is, um, you know, it was a mask. You know, a lot of yeah. the time I was, like, I mean, at my worst, I was drinking four bottles of whiskey a week. Uh, my Friday night drink, or we'll have a, a rugby connection. My Friday night drink watching the old Celtic League was I used to drink a pint glass of vodka. And uh, I'd nearly always drink a bottle of cough syrup with that. Now, if a normal person uh, drank that, you would you would die from alcohol poisoning. But my tolerance mm. had gone up and up and up. Yet, at the same time, my public persona was everything is fine in my life, you know, and it clearly wasn't. And that's it's lovely that you can say that about rugby because um, and say that about Leinster culture, because, um, you know, I think it's. Just like the sport evolved, I think, you know, society, people, people evolves. I promised myself I wasn't going to ask you 50 rugby questions. I think I've, I've, I've successfully avoided lots of rugby questions. Oh, there hasn't been too many. <laughs> hasn't been too many. I have to finish on, on, on a couple of short ones, Ross. The first one, where's your, outside, obviously, of the RDS, where's your favourite place to play uh, or that you've played that you thought was smashing? Um... In terms of atmosphere, in terms of, you know... Uh, Tom and Park at the Christmas game is always brilliant. Um, obviously, when it's a, a full house, um, is amazing. Uh, some you of the enjoy, French clubs... You enjoy the warm welcome that you get in Tom and... Yeah, of course, it, it's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so some, of the, some of the French clubs, are their fans are just incredible. Like, even when we played La Rochelle, um, obviously there was no one in the stadium, but when we got off the bus, it must have been two or three thousand... And there was flares and they were going mental, screaming at us, but it was absolutely phenomenal. Um, and similarly, we played Toulouse a couple of years ago over there, like the, call it the, the greeting or the, the, the welcome yeah, yeah. off the bus. Like yeah. it's, it's incredibly hostile and it's amazing. And I suppose the remarkable thing kind of I find about a lot of those French clubs is that no matter what happens result-wise in the game, afterwards they always give you a big round of applause and thank you for the game. And I suppose they're kind of, they just kind of love rugby, I suppose. And they're incredibly yeah. kind of respectful of, of the game, I suppose. Um, so I suppose, yeah, they're probably the, the standout ones. Yeah. And can I ask who, 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 in terms of players, and if you want to go with someone who's retired, that's fine. If you don't want to go with someone who's current, but who's who, who do you rate like physically as one of the biggest challenges you've played against? Like, who do you know that you've been out there uh, the next day? Physically, who uh, I suppose Will Skelton's probably an obvious one. <laughs> um, or even uh, Charles Pieto actually was when we played against him for Ulster, yeah. <laughs> playing against him a few times, just been like, This guy's made of steel, <laughs> and like yeah. he's uh, he's a serious like, specimen, like he's 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 big, yeah. but he's I think for me, what I like about him is you know, he's managed to get very large bulk, but he has flexibility, acceleration, you know, he's 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 a very he yeah, he can do everything, which is bloody. I mean, mad. yeah, he'd be up there in terms of 
some, like one of the best players I've ever played against. Um, in terms of, yeah, he can run straight over you if he wants, or else he can step you and you won't even touch him. Um, and he can pass, kick, he can kind of, he can do it all. So he was, he's definitely up there, yeah. Yeah. And in terms of, you know, growing up as a kid, um, so... I suppose, look, for me, I suppose for a lot of people, Jonah Loma was just incredible. And, you know, particularly running over my cat, I, I you know, I still watch it now and again. <laughs> <laughs> it just, it just, it just was sporting brilliance. But um, as a kid watching rugby, who was, who, who did you watch on TV and go, do you know what, I'd love to do that? Uh, Matt Kiddo was always one. Um, really? Yeah, not, not that I can do what he did. But, um, yeah, he was always, I thought he was always kind of, pretty remarkable um, in terms of the Pinell's played 10, 12 internationally and um, he was never the biggest guy either um, I just thought he was always incredibly clever um, I always really loved watching him play I mean, yeah, he's somehow he, he's still playing whatever age yeah he had that he had that magic factor I, I like that player you know the guy that um, I, I'm not sure I want him on the team but you know the guy you, you, if you gave him the ball on the bus he'd take a shot you know you, you just don't know what he's going to do and he probably doesn't know himself what he's going to do as well. exactly <laughs> exactly well, speaking of magical, listen, I've honestly, God, I am shocked. I've just looked at the clock. I can't believe how long we've been chatting. I so, so appreciate you coming on and having a chat with me. Uh, I know a lot of people will love listening to this. Um, you're a very quiet, very private guy, and that's why I was delighted and shocked that you came on. But um, continued success with Leinster, and uh, I look forward to watching you in, in the flesh in the coming months when we put this, uh, this horrible COVID behind us. And thank you so much. Oh.